Okay, so this month we are going to look at audio programming with Cinder. And Cinder is a library that we've looked at before. It's a multimedia graphics and audio type library designed to make it extremely simple to create interactive graphics applications. And let's take a look. So, Cinder, you can find their documentation at libcinder.org. Uh, here there's a download that you can use to download a zip file. You can also just clone it straight from GitHub. It's an open source library. And when I downloaded this, Let's go over here. Let's make this bigger. And go over to this one. Make this one bigger. So when I, um, <coughs> this is their canned Visual Studio project for Cinder. It's a Visual Studio 2015 project. I happen to have it open in Visual Studio 2019 because uh, I like the IDE improvements, but you'll notice uh, you can't see that yet, can you? Ha. In the Solution Explorer, you'll see that it says Visual Studio 2015. So their distribution comes with project files for Visual Studio 2015. Uh, it also has, <coughs> excuse me, a CMake-based build. Um, when I tried to build it straight out of the box for Visual Studio 2019 with no extra options. I got some compilation errors <coughs> and I suspect that's a result of the default C++ standard that is specified on Visual Studio 2019 versus Visual Studio 2015. So I don't think it's too big of a deal. Uh, people are saying they can't hear. Uh, let's try this. I always have this problem with these web apps. Can anyone hear when I turn on my mic? I can hear you. I heard you okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So it's just me. So is the only person we cannot hear can is Richard? Hear <laughs> All right. I wonder can if you hear me now? Rich's no. Mic. Let's try this. Probably. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Much better. These uh, web applications that serve as like video audio conferencing things, I, I just think they're really buggy because I nothing's running locally. I can't control how they interact with my hardware. Uh, anyway, you can hear me now. Great. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. let me start so over there. I'm zooming a ton on the code, by the way. I'm getting it pretty blurry. I don't know if that's a problem for anyone else, but yeah, I'm getting it blurry here. I got It'll I gotta, probably yeah. clear up over time, I hope but so. um, you know, it's broadcasting at HD, 1920 by 1080. I got the font size cranked up uh, to 125 percent. I can't control the video quality of the stream either. It's it's just the nature of this software. So um, let's just go back here really quick. I am doing the wrong button. So Cinder, as I was saying, is a toolkit for graphical multimedia applications. Uh, graphics are really its strong point. It has makes it very easy for you to create interactive graphics applications. Without have you can get easily get started without having to know all the ins and out of like OpenGL or things like that. But it also has good audio support. So uh, let's go back over here real quick. So when you download the Cinder distribution, it will be a zip file of source. So it doesn't have a binary distribution as near as I can tell. Uh, it was also I was surprised to find it wasn't supported on VC package. So you have to get 
the zip, download it. Um, I've loaded the solution that they created, which is a Visual Studio 2015 solution. I've loaded that into Visual Studio 2019 because I like the 2019 IDE better, but as long as you have the Visual Studio 2015 toolchain installed, which is an optional install under Visual Studio 2019's installer, I believe. On my machine, I just happen to have Visual Studio 2015 already installed. Uh, if it's not an option in the 2019 installer, you can install 2015 side by side, no problem. Um, I, it has a CMake based build as well. I tried configuring Cinder through CMake for Visual Studio 2019. I got some compilation errors. I think it's because between 2015 and 2019, the default C++ standard has changed and the Cinder code doesn't quite reflect uh, current C++ standards. So for instance, they were using file system from the STUD experimental namespace instead of the STUD namespace. So um, at the moment, the simplest way to get everything running is to compile with Visual Studio 2015, at least on Windows. Uh, they have build instructions for Mac and for Linux as well. Um, I didn't investigate building on those platforms. But uh, Cinder, when you build Cinder itself, it's basically a giant static library with everything in it. And you'll notice in here things like JSON, CPP, FreeType, QTime, SVG, TinyEXR. These are third-party libraries of source code that basically just get compiled as additional source files as part of the single Cinder library. So when you build your own applications, a uh, question in the chat is no Conan package. I don't like Conan myself, so I didn't look, but there might be a Conan package. I'm not a fan of Conan. I prefer VC package. Um, and I say that having tried Conan, we did a presentation on it a while back. I found VC package to be much more reliable and um, much better at solving my problems on Windows, which is the more complicated build environment. So you should always solve the hard problem first and then the easy problems are easy. But digression aside, I didn't check to see if it has a Conan package. It might. Uh, but you can just clone it from GitHub. Uh, they have fairly frequent releases on their GitHub page. Um, so as I said, there's a bunch of these third-party libraries that are uh, bound into the Cinder library so that it simplifies your project linking. You just link against Cinder and then you get everything. Now, um, since we're talking about audio, down here in their audio uh, section of their project, you'll see things like this uh, Og Vorbis codec. So on all platforms, Og Vorbis, which is an open source audio codec. On all platforms, Og Vorbis is supported. So you can rely on that to work everywhere. And on platforms that have native audio support like Mac OS and Windows, the list of codecs that are supported depends on what is shipped with the operating system. In Windows, they use a library called Media Foundation, which is a relatively recent audio library support on Windows. The if, if you're familiar with like the legal history of Windows and the bundling of Media Player, you might be familiar with something called these Windows N editions that are like the editions that are legally required to be distributed in South Korea and a few places where they uh, sought under court case to have the multimedia facilities of Windows unbundled from Windows. And me, silly enough, when I installed Windows on this machine, I accidentally picked a Windows N version, so I had to go and get the optional OS feature for Media Foundation to install that for Cinder to work. So if you run a Cinder application and it says something like, I can't find mfplat.dll or some other mf whatever dll, that's what you're bumping into. Most people probably don't have those weird 
N editions installed in their machine, so they're never going to run into it. But I just thought I'd mention it because it's a rather obtuse and obscure error, and it's not exactly obvious what's going wrong if you run into that. So on Windows, the supile, su supported audio codec formats are the typical things you would expect, WAV, MP3, and so on. So when you get sender and download it and build it, you get one big static library. And then there's a, another project that they distribute that builds all the samples. And they have good documentation, which we'll look at in a second. But um, really, the best way to understand the functionality of these different portions of Cinder is to uh, load up the samples and try them out. So what I have done is I went to their Let's move this over so you can see it. I went to their all samples solution and I just deleted out all the samples that weren't audio related. So this is the one we will start with, but let's go back and look at the documentation a little bit first. So if you remember from last month when we looked at audio programming with Marcius that had a flow graph mechanism let's go over here to the guide that had a flow graph mechanism where you had processing nodes that were either source nodes that acted as a source of audio data either they were reading a file or they were running a procedural uh, function generator like a sine wave generator or the white noise generator and so on so you had generating nodes that were the source of data you had processing nodes that had input data and transformed that data to produce an output and then you had output nodes that took a stream of data and sunk it into something whether that sync was a speaker headphones etc or whether it was um, a file uh, so in the chat they're saying it's still very blurry um, why don't I use Zoom? And the answer is because I'm using Jitsi. It's not a satisfying answer, but it is the answer. It will be clearer when it is uploaded onto YouTube. I, that's all I can tell you. I can't control, even I don't think in Zoom, you can. I've never run a Zoom meeting, but in Jitsi, I can't control what bandwidth is assigned to the video stream to anybody. It's the weakest link on the internet between me and you. So, um. I mean, the best I can do is make this a little bigger, but it, it has to be small enough so we can see something useful on the screen. So, Cinder has a low-level, or a, shall I say, a kind of mid-level layer that is a node graph sep a representation where things are connected up via nodes. But on top of that, they have a what they call a voice API that just gives you the ability to say, like, take this sound file and start playing it, stop playing it, pause it, uh, resume playing it, etc. And for most simple audio processing, that's what you're going to want to see. For more advanced audio processing, you'll want to uh, go to the node API and connect up nodes and we'll see how to do that in a moment <clears throat> and if necessary you can create your own nodes to interact with the node graph and there is good support in Cinder for uh, monitoring audio data and turning that into a visual representation which we will see in a little bit so in their audio guide, which is what we're looking at here, is there, this is the block diagram of the overall architecture I just explained. They go through how to use the voice API, what the structure of audio buffers look like, um, basically all samples in Cinder at the point where you manipulate them directly are represented as floats and there's multiple channels supported within a stream of data so you can have a stereo stream you can have a 5.1 stream a 7.1 stream or an arbitrary number of channels in the stream it is not 
limited to understanding things like 5.1 and 7.1. Then the channels and what they represent is arbitrary and can be decided by you. Uh, the main way that you interact with building a graph of nodes is through an audio context. This basically acts as a factory for creating nodes that you connect together. So typically uh, there's a context make node method that you call with an instance of a new node that you've allocated off the heap. Uh, there's also specialized factory methods on the audio context for creating nodes that are hardware uh, dependent. So a node that is like, uh, for instance, uh, audio playback to a hardware device or audio sourcing from a device like a microphone or a line in input. And in Cinder, the context is where um, parameters like the sample rate and the number of frames within a block, a block being the chunk of data that you process at any given time within a node. So those are parameters that are put onto the context and as opposed to being associated with the buffer. So all the nodes are associated with the context. The context understands the sample rates and everybody uses the same sample rate. Now that's different from Marcius where the sample rate uh, is carried along with the stream and it can change between nodes. And we saw in Marcius that you can have a node that analyzes an audio stream to produce a spectral power and it does that by doing a fast Fourier transform and then it produces the results in buckets that are associated with the audio data but they don't have the same sample rate as the audio data or the same um, you know kind of frame layout if you will so that's a difference here between cinder and marcius uh, cinder is full featured but not as flexible and as advanced of an audio processor, processor as Marcius because in Cinder it's not the primary role of this library to do just audio. So while it gives you pretty advanced levels of control and the fact that you can take these arbitrary nodes and connect them up into an arbitrary processing graph, some things are a little more simplified and fixed compared to Marcius. Um, there's also no scripting language that allows you to create an, a graph of nodes from a simple text description. Uh, however, there are some um, aspects between Marcius and Cinder's uh, node-based API that are the same. And one of those things is that nodes have what... Uh, scrolling to see if they mention it here on this page yes okay so in Marcius we talked about um, parameters and values that they called controls that affect the uh, computation performed by any given node so for instance if it's a sine wave generator there's a control in Marcius that says what the frequency of the sine wave is. The parallel concept in Cinder is a thing called these param, this param. And these params in Cinder give you the ability to specify variation of the parameters over time by making a method call on the node. So in their little example here, they've got a sine wave generator node they get the frequency parameter for the sine wave and then they apply a time varying ramp to the frequency parameter of the sine wave generating node and that changes the frequency of the sine wave in a in essentially in a timeline and you can apply a single ramp globally and that will use the timeline for that one ramp so it'll be one interpolation for the parameters given to the ramp, a start and end point and a duration. 
or you can append several elements together and build up a more complicated timeline where the parameters are changing uh, not just according to one ramp but according to as many ramps as you append to a single timeline. Uh, the interpolation of the parameters is linear by default, but you can change that. Why would you want to change that? Well, there are many things in audio processing that don't operate perceptively linear. And what I mean by that is when you change the volume up and down, you don't, uh, to get perceived levels of equal change in volume, you actually have to change the volume logarithmically and not linearly. So, some, and, and this is why the standard unit for measuring the loudness of a sound is decibels. That is a logarithmic scale. So, um, really good volume controls understand that you want equal changes in the control to be equal increments of loudness if it's a, if it's a volume control, for instance, so that you won't adjust the parameter linearly you'll adjust it logarithmically uh, so that's a difference between Marcius and Cinder is that this ability to have like a simple timeline and have each node understand its own timeline and your ability to set interpolating parameters on that timeline is really simple which means it's easy to get up and going in Cinder with audio effects that are varying over time and the sender documentation consists of two uh, chunks, really, or two different styles of documentation. There are these guides. Here we're looking at the, the guide for audio and sender. And then within the other section is this reference API, which is basically a Doxygen style generated API. So here you can find, here's all the classes that are nodes, and they're in a inheritance relationship so all the input nodes are just you know derived from a single intermediate class called input node for instance and there's also documentation here on the params and um, the params are related to let's just go back here a little bit Okay, so basically when you have a node, you can get its options. And here they're um, getting the option for the ramp function to apply a, uh, this is a nonlinear ramp that they're going to apply to a parameter. And the options for a particular parameter are using a builder pattern to specify one or more options that are combined together. So here they've created this options object. It's in the audio param namespace and this is all within the sender namespace which is CI. And then having constructed the default options they use a builder pattern to uh, modify the ramp function value in the options and uh, this whole thing returns another instance of the options. So y you can daisy chain this up. You can say dot ramp fun, give the ramp out quad specification. Then you can say dot begin time and add a begin time into this set of options that you use to apply a ramp to a node or the, it, apply a ramp to a parameter on a node. So similar in structure to Mars, yes, uh, but also different. It's, it's simpler. So it's easier to get up and running uh, with, you know, the, the easy things are easy. Harder things are possible, but they're not necessarily easy. So if we look over here at the audio samples, um, let's take a look at the basic use of the voice API. Um, but first, let's, since it's been a while since we talked about Cinder, Let's just digress briefly into the application model for Cinder. So here I am looking at appbase.h, which is the base class for all the applications. You notice it has a bunch of methods, but 
some of the methods are virtual and basically in a Cinder application they want to make it extremely easy for you to get default implementation but be able to supply your own overriding implementation where necessary so the basic execution loop begins with a call to setup and then the execution loop is going to run forever calling update and draw and until the application quits that loop will continue to run and inside cinder their application framework gives you methods where you can override events event basically you override event handlers that by default do nothing in the base application so for instance the event handler for a mouse down event in the default base application all the event handlers are just empty curly braces so they don't do anything they provide a definition but it's a uh, definition that doesn't do anything application specific so in your Cinder application if you want to handle mouse events you just override a method you don't need to worry about how does the Windows system encode mouse events and how are the coordinates in the mouse event related to the application window and all, all of that kind of stuff it's all simplified and made relatively easy for you in Cinder and uh, they do have uh, touch support and uh, keyboard event support and then at the end of the application lifecycle you're given a chance to implement uh, a cleanup routine and your um, they also have like a a function here that's called during uh, a function you can use to request a, a graceful shutdown of the application so let's go back take a look now that we have oriented ourselves around a basic cinder application now when we look at this code for these samples they make a little bit more sense so here in their setup method for the basic voice application demo they are loading a resource and in Windows a resource is just a way to stick a binary blob into your executable if we drill into these little macros that are defined uh, for this sample so this resources dot H is specific to the basic uh, the voice basic sample but they have a generic way of declaring a resource for sender to use and this macro accepts relative file path of uh, relative directly location of the resource so it can find it at build time the file name uh, this 128 is the resource ID and this uh, sound is just uh, turned into a string at least on Windows so that you can see um, what those resources look like in the resource editor I'll just show you what that looks like quickly just so you can point yourself so here in the resources editor you see there's a just this folder with a string name named sound and within there is a resource ID that is the value has the value 128 and let me just bring this properties window over here so you can see that if you look at the properties for that particular resource it says basically it's an external file and here's the file name here's its resource ID is 128 so that's how these seemingly let me highlight that again so it shows in the properties window that's how these values to this cinder resource macro result in a Windows resource they do something similar on Mac OS not being a uh, Mac OS resource expert I don't know exactly how it looks in Xcode but there will be something similar I imagine so back to the code here so we've got that resource that we declared that at build time turns into a, a piece of binary data being stuck in the executable load resource will obtain a pointer to that binary data blob and it's still untyped it's just it's just a pointer to a bag of bytes and we tell the audio system to load that resource so now it gets that raw binary data gets interpreted as 
a uh, piece of audio data and then we create a voice from that the voice being the higher level abstraction in Cinder that just gives you simple load some audio and play it no node graph manipulation and when we run this what we get is a little application and as I click on here you should hear the, uh, the sound being played back at different levels of volume. It's playing softly if I click low and it's playing louder if I click higher up. Now, can you guys in the chat let me know if you were just able to hear that? Okay, good. So, what is going on here? Well, in their mouse down handler, they're computing the volume from the Y coordinate. They're computing pan, so whether or not it's going to appear, whether it's going to, going to play back on the left channel or the right channel from the X coordinate. Let's run that again so we can... Last time people said the stereo aspect of the audio didn't come through on the stream, but hopefully it should get recorded correctly in, uh, for YouTube this time. But if I click to the left, I hear it in my left speaker of my headphones. And if I click on the right, I hear it on the right speaker in my headphones. So there, the, uh, the voice object that was created up here has, a, has volume and pan controls that you can uh, just set by calling methods. And during, let's just see if we can run this so you can see this behavior. Uh, we start playing the sound file, and if I click again, then it stops the sound file and starts playing it over again. So that's the sound file all the way through. If I repeatedly click, it restarts it at the beginning. And further, they're looking for uh, presses of the space key, and the space key basically pauses or stops. If, if the voice is playing, it pauses it, and if it's not playing, it starts it. And down here, they're just draw, if their, their draw method is just drawing a constant color background so that we have something to look at. Uh, and this final Cinder app macro is just their way of instantiating the main loop for the application. They've supplied a little lambda that lets them a Lambda function that takes a settings object and it lets them uh, customize the behavior of the application by adjusting the settings before the application is launched. In this case, they've disabled multi-touch for this particular application. So what we see here is it's pretty easy to load a fixed sound file from a resource that is attached to our application. Now there are other overloads of this, uh, sorry not overloads, but there is a class here called a data source that allows us to associate a file system path as a source of data. So if we were Let's go back here. If we were obtaining the path to a sound file at runtime by browsing a dialog or a drag and drop operation, have something like that, we can specify that the resource will be loaded from a file system path and that will give us a data source reference. But in this case, in these samples, they're pretty much loading everything from resources. It just makes things a little simpler. Now, a um, general comment on classes and naming within Cinder. They use shared pointers fairly frequently. For so for instance, when we saw this, uh, when we looked into the declaration of this load function, we saw that it took a data source ref and pretty much anything in Cinder that has a name ending in ref 
is going to be just a type def for a shared pointer to the underlying class, which is the name without the ref. So when you see um, something ref in the documentation, just know that, oh, that just means it's a shared pointer to the underlying class that is the same name without the ref. So that is, you know, not much code for the interaction that was specified, right? We've got handling mouse events, handling keyboard events. We're doing a really simplistic draw. And our setup just created uh, a voice ref by calling a create function and feeding it some audio data. Now, you notice that there's no use or mention anywhere in here of the audio context. And that's one of the things that the voice uh, layer it doesn't make the context inaccessible but it makes it so that you don't have to think about the context uh, as a question does cinder handle 3d audio like what you see in some games um, I haven't seen any direct 3d support for um, for instance putting some objects in 3D space in a scene graph and then having Cinder automatically compute the audio based on the audio volume level based on the distance between the sound source and the player which is rendered from the viewpoint but you can easily set the audio uh, this particular application wasn't doing any dynamic updates it was only responding to input so they didn't override the update method they only overrode the draw method but in your update method would be where you would typically if you have uh, the viewer moving res with respect to audio sources you would compute the new distance in your update method and then you would set the um, pan and volume parameters based on the new positions uh, does that answer your question And when we looked at the base library, it had more explicit support for uh, sound sources at different 3D positions and setting the volume and panning controls based on those 3D positions. Um, so in the chat, it was stated, I was also thinking about Atmos. I know I've heard of Dolby Atmos, and I believe that's like it's either a 5.1 or a 7.1 mixing scheme is that correct so in cinder we'll look at an example where they do multi-channel output so you could if you knew the geometry of your 7.1 speaker system or your 5.1 speaker system then you can compute the relative uh, volume and pan I mean it's not pan it's kind of more thought of in a stereo sense but it's setting the appropriate volume for each output channel for a sound source and using that knowledge of the geometry of the speaker configuration and how many channels corresponded to each of the speakers you can make a spatial sound effect by adjusting the relative volume that's that's really all those mixing schemes do to make the sound seem like it's moving past you is they're changing the volume level of the different speakers over time so uh, it doesn't I didn't see anything in the documentation specifically talking about Atmos or 5.1 or 7.1. It's just arbitrary multi-channel that you can configure. And you, uh, I, I would assume that in a 5.1 system on a PC, you would have a way of identifying each, um, I don't remember what they call it, I think it's an output node in Cinder. And each output node you would associate with an output device. And I would assume that you would have a different output device for each speaker, or you would have a single output device that exposed six channels for 5.1 or eight channels for 7.1. Uh, my audio system is not that fancy, so I haven't tried that. But I would believe that that's how you would address it. But there's no built-in support for those things out of the box. You'd have to cook that up yourself. But it, it shouldn't be hard. Um, but you would have to write that code yourself. So let's take a look at um, 
the next use of voice. So this was fine. I mean, we're just playing back a sound file, you know, and that's easy. So easy things are easy. That's good. But what if we want to procedurally generate sounds on our own, either because maybe we're using a codec that Cinder doesn't understand, uh, or we're using uh, procedure, some kind of procedurally generated sounds. So how would you do that using uh, the voice API? Well, it, it is possible. So let's uh, let's try this way. Let's just see what this sounds like first before we look at the code. So here, it's generating a single tone. Uh, let me go louder. If I click higher, the volume is louder. And if I click from left to right, it changes the frequency of the tone that's being generated. So it's just a single sine wave. And it's changing the color to give me feedback of the tone and volume that I've chosen. So if, if it's a lower volume, it's a darker color. And if it's a louder tone, then it's a uh, brighter color. And I can drag around here and get, you know, little interesting audio effects. So how are they doing that? So in their setup, they're creating a voice with the factory function again. And instead of supplying a data source reference to the create function, this time if we look at it, so here was the create factory function that we called before that takes a source file ref. Now we're calling this overload that's taking a callback processor function. And in this case, they've just supplied it as a lambda. By parameterizing the lambda on this, they're able to access these member variables, which in my IDE are currently colored in kind of a purple. So these are member variables. Their coding convention is that member variables member variables begin with a lowercase m. So since we are ac able to access the this pointer in our lambda, we're able to reference these member variables without any additional grief. And basically all that's happening is this lambda gets the channel from the input buffer and then loops over the number of frames in the buffer computes a sine wave value from a phase variable and a frequency variable and writes those values into the buffer and then that's done uh, just make sure I'm correct in how I'm okay so there um, How are they changing the frequency dynamically? I think this function is being called every time the voice needs samples. It's not just once. It's not just computing a table of samples at the time that the voice is created. Because what they're doing is using this function. They're storing a reference to this function inside the voice. And then when the voice needs samples, it calls this function to generate them into the buffer. So as we are moving the mouse around, it's calling this handle move function. The frequency is updated from the X position of the mouse event, and the volume is computed from the Y coordinate of the mouse event and is used to, the, the frequency will get used when the voice computes new samples and the volume will be used immediately as a parameter on the voice. And back here, when they are doing their draw override, they're just computing a background color that's based on the volume of the voice and the frequency that's being used to generate samples. So again, simple API, but gives me the ability to generate my own arbitrary stream of samples that I want to feed into audio playback. 
Uh, any questions on this uh, voice API before we start going deeper and look at a little bit of the Node API stuff? Okay, doesn't seem like there's any questions. Just interrupt me at any time if you have any questions come up. Uh, Adam says in the chat, I got the voice basic example working after checking Cinder out from GitHub. I have 2019 installed and do not have the 2015 build tools or a few issues. Change the standard to C++17. Okay, good. So I, I just didn't feel like debugging their build. Like lately at work, I've been you know saddled with a bunch of build-related issues. So I, since they provided projects out of the box, I just wanted to use that just to make my life easier. Uh, Jamie, yeah, asks, it, it's it's definitely got some issues. Some of the samples are working. Some of them are crashing. Um, but a lot of them do work. So I just thought I'd mention that. And you might okay. be able to start working without 2015. It might be an option. So it, I, it, I've, it I'm me, sure if I invested some time, I could make it work, you know, and get everything working. I, I just didn't feel like feel like doing it. Um, so also in the chat, uh, there's a question I was going to ask, is there a limitation to what audio formats you can load in? Um, well, since you ultimately can create your own input node that understands any format that is not already supported, you there's no inherent limitation, right? It ships out of the box with the very common formats provided. In, in Windows, they're using the so-called Media Foundation Library. So any audio format that Media Foundation Library understands, you can load. And as I mentioned, they have an Og Vorbis codec implementation that is compiled in. So if you want to be guaranteed that your audio is going to play, uh, is going to load and play on every platform, you can just use Og Vorbis. But for, you know, maybe you don't have control over that because you're letting the user, you know, browse to files at runtime. So it's whatever the platform supports out of the box. And if you want to support additional codecs, um, you can create your own input node and you know do basically parse out the file extension and say like oh it's a dot frob file that's my own custom audio file i need to use my codec node to read that in to produce samples or you can it's an open source library so you can add support to the library directly uh more chat questions uh this question is uh can i ask him unrelated questions unrelated to sender uh but related to this group uh you can uh, once I uh, am done with the presentation, I'm happy to entertain questions on any topic, um, and uh, I try to pay attention to comments on Meetup. But we don't have a like a forum or anything like that. That a specific place. I mean, the C plus plus community is so huge that I wouldn't want people thinking they had to get answers from me when they could use something like Stack Overflow. So, um, uh. Following on to that, it says, I am new to development and C++, and I'm just looking for a group to ask for help and stuff, and I found you on Meetup. Uh, really, my recommendation is if you're stuck with something, try Stack Overflow. It's a great community there. Lots of knowledgeable C++ developers, people that are always willing to help. There are other forums that are specific to C++. Um, I'm too busy to monitor them, so I just let other people serve that role in the community. And um, for me personally, like I said, I try to monitor comments on our meetup events. And if uh, somebody asks a question there, you know, I will help if I notice it and I know the answer. There's also uh, Discord servers for C++. There are Slack servers for C++. So there's a big community of people out there that are willing to help. Um, I wouldn't want you to think you have to come to me and as the way to get help without recommending all those other people first because they're online 24-7 and always paying attention and they're, they're very helpful. So that I would definitely recommend all those sources, Stack Overflow, Slack, Discord, etc. Okay. Um, so that's the basic voice API. So really simple um, playback. I don't need to worry about the context or anything like that. But if we want more uh, advanced processing, we can manipulate the nodes directly. So if we take a look at 
basic node manipulation. So um, if you were here last month when we talked about Marcius, this will look pretty familiar. So they've got, in this sample, they're using these node refs, which are, again, just type defs for shared pointers to the underlying node classes. And they are obtaining nodes with the make node factory from the context. So in this case, they got the master context from the audio namespace. By just, it, the context, uh, I believe, exists all the time. So this master function is not is more like an accessor than a factory function. There's a single global context that's shared by everything you're doing, audio-wise in Cinder. And so once you have the context, you can call this make node factory function to get instances of processing nodes. Here they've created a sine wave generator node and a gain node for adjusting volume. They're using methods specific to the individual node types to, for instance, set the frequency of the sine wave that is generated by the sine wave generator node and set the value of the gain on the gain node. And unlike uh, Marcius, they have a little bit of syntactic sugar here for connecting the nodes. So they're using uh, kind of stream extraction, you know, they're using the, the greater greater operator as a shortcut for saying connect one node to another node. And if we drill into this operator really quick, we can see that it's an inline function that takes two nodes, an input and an output. The input is on the left and the output is on the right. And all this does is connect the input to the output and then returns the output so that you can daisy chain these oper operator greater greater applications one after another. So this is mgen was the input. It was connected as the output. It, its output was connected to the input of mgain. And then M gain is the result of this highlighted expression. So then M gain has its output connected to the input of the output node for the context. The context's get output method returns the, the default output node, which is usually the speakers. But you can, obviously, if you wanted to connect to a file sync, to record data into a file, you can connect that instead of the get output from the context. Now, in Cinder, nodes that generate data all by themselves without being connected to a file, actually, I, I take that back. I think it's all nodes that generate data, so they have no inputs and only outputs. So generator nodes have to be enabled to produce audio. And the context further has to be enabled. So these two enable steps and, you know, connecting, creating these nodes and setting up the graph and all that, that was all taken care of for you when you use the voice layer. It was taken care of for you so that, you know, the simplest case of just playing back some audio, you didn't have to worry about all this stuff. The enabling, the creating the nodes, getting access to the context and so on. But when you need more control, the audio context and the individual nodes give you direct access to that control. And here, you know, mouse drag is similar as changing the frequency of the generator node and changing the volume with a gain node. And again, just drawing, <coughs> in this case, they're drawing a color that represents the value of the gain as the background color. So if we run this one, it's very similar. Ah, I was clicking. They didn't override mouse click. They override, they overrode mouse drag. So as I drag and my cursor goes lower on the window, the volume is lower, volume is higher. If my cursor's higher and the frequency is changing as I move from left to right, but only when I drag. If I just click, 
you can't hear it, but I'm clicking and nothing's happening because they didn't override mouse click. So very similar to the voice sample that we saw, it's just now they're creating the node graph and manipulating the nodes directly. Um, a more advanced use of nodes we can see in here. Let's just run this and see what this has looked like first. So let me stop that while I talk. So this application is using a triangle wave generator followed by a low pass filter followed by a volume control a gain node and then followed by a monitor node and sorry let's make sure I, I said that correctly okay so here's the this this is creating all the nodes they're not connected yet the generator feeds the low pass filter feeds into the gain and the and that goes to the speaker but the gain also has a secondary output where it is connected to the monitor node and the monitor node is how it is getting information about the audio that's being played to create that little visualization now let's take a look at the code here so we can understand what that visualization was trying to show us it was showing us two different visual aspects. First there was a turquoise dot that was moving back and forth left to right is moving randomly and that dot is showing you which note on the pentatonic scale is being played and then the upper right was a little waveform graph drawing a representation of the audio frame that was playing. Now what I found interesting about this sample is that you notice this little comment here I'll read it for those that can't see it clearly on the stream uh, they're saying many times it is easier to specify musical pitches in MIDI format which is linear rather than in Hertz so they fill an array by pushing back values of the pentatonic notes for the C major scale from C3 to C5 represented as MIDI values so this pentatonic scale here if we drill into this definition of this it's just a vector a stood vector of size t's and they're pushing on there a bunch of specific numbers that represents the notes from the C major scale that they wanted to uh, have played back and if we look at how this array gets used when they call their update function every frame the update function will get a random integer that's within 0 to the size m minus 1 of that array so it's basically an index into that pentatonic scale computed randomly then um, pulling the value out at that random index is the MIDI pitch and then there's a helper function in the audio namespace called MIDI to frequency that given a MIDI pitch value will produce the appropriate Hertz for that note and then this is where we see a use of the ramp abilities <coughs> excuse me on the generator node this is a triangle wave generator so the triangle wave generator they get the frequency parameter for the triangle wave generator they apply a ramp to ramp to the frequency corresponding to the MIDI note that was randomly selected out of that array and there's a member variable here that is the ramp time so that is how much time is they are they going to take to reach the ramp value from wherever it is currently and in their mouse drag handler they are updating the frequency time and sorry the ramp time that we just mentioned and the frequency applied to the low pass filter so a triangle wave has sharp discontinuities in the waveform those sharp discontinuities generate high frequency content 
and the low pass filter strips off the unwanted high frequency noise from the triangle wave. So now that we've looked at the code, let's run this again and we'll see what happens as I drag the mouse around. So it's doing random notes. This sine wave pattern that's being drawn up there is the representation of the raw audio samples. If I If I drag to the right, it's more samples. It's taking longer amounts of time to interpolate between these notes. And as I drag up, it's doing fewer... Uh, sorry, it is increasing the bandwidth of the low-pass filter, so larger frequencies are getting passed through. You can see now that this is looking more like a triangle at times. If I bring it all the way to the top, it gets pretty obvious. Okay. So, we can see that a more, in this example of more advanced use of, use of this node graph, they're using the update loop to change parameters on the nodes in the graph. Uh, they use this little trick of turning a MIDI note into a frequency for a wave generator and they've connected up nodes using this uh, greater greater syntax but more importantly you see that they were able a node can have more than can be connected to more than one output so in this case the gain is connected to the speaker but it's also connected to this monitor now we didn't look at the monitor okay so when we go into the draw part of the update loop it is obtaining information from the monitor it's using this little helper called draw audio buffer if we drill into that it's got an audio buffer and a rectangle and it's basically just drawing the waveform using OpenGL to create that visual representation of the audio wave that was playing. And then down here they are using uh, just a simple computation of that circle and they're just using draw solid circle. Uh, a little help. These um, functions in this GL namespace are helpers from Cinder. So they, they simplify OpenGL for common use cases. So again, simple things are simple. If you want to do more complicated things, you can access OpenGL directly if you need to. But if you just want to do simple displays, the simple things are simple and the harder things are possible. Um, we won't run this one, but I'll just show it to you briefly. If you need to create your own custom node, that is possible as well. Here they've got a custom tremolo node. It derives from a basic audio node and you'll see in here there is a process function that they override and there's an initialized function that they override and if we look in the source file here's the in entire um, contents of it. Uh, their initialize is just initializing some member variables to um, beginning values. So every time the graph is uh, started and stopped when you start it all the nodes are reinitialized so whatever these parameters got set to during the processing of a previous sound when you reinitialize the node the next time they'll get reset back to sensible default values and in the process portion basically your job in the process method is to fill this buffer with values so they figure out some structure about the buffer, basically the number of frames that are in it, and then they get a pointer to the array of floats that represents the raw sample values. They figure out the phase for this particular um, portion of the, the buffer, which is divided into frames. And then they're storing, well, in this case, it's a tremolo effect, so it's not 
it, it's taking the existing value and modulating it. Uh, so that's what a tremolo effect is. It's a modulation of an input signal to produce a modulated output signal. So if you need to create your own node, this is one way to do it. Now you can, this is, uh, you know, by writing your own custom class. Now, I, as I was browsing through the documentation for the different nodes that are available in Cinder, I saw that they also have a node class that takes a lambda, and the lambda fills in the buffer during the process method. So you just because you want to do custom processing, you're not required to write your own class. You could use that. Let's see if we can find what they call it. Uh, they call it callback processor node. So this, it's an input node that processes audio with a, a std function callback. So if you want to do custom processing, it's not required that you write your own class. But if it's more than just a simple override of that process method, then you know you have custom initialization that needed to do or custom teardown, then it would be better probably to write your own class. But if you just needed to do some processing, uh, you know, in terms of you know, some kind of something that can be represented as a simple callback function, then this callback processor node might be a better fit. Um, not every node class that they have in Cinder is described in that guide or in the samples. So you might notice in here there's, you know, bandpass filter, there's high pass, low pass filters, monitor spectral node for monitoring the spectral content of an audio stream as opposed to just the raw audio sample values, uh, 2D pan, etc. So these, um, they've got the generator nodes here and the uh, generic and processing nodes here and um, it's not as full featured as the set of processing nodes that came with Marcius but it is fairly rich nonetheless um, I suppose it would be possible to you know both Marcius and Cinder are open source so if Marcius had some processing you wanted to steal you could just go take the implementation of their node class. It wouldn't be hard to transform it to match the processing that's going on in Cinder because they're they're conceptually very similar. They just have some small details that are different between the two, as we discussed earlier. So let's go back here. Um, and there was a question about handling multiple channels, so we'll take a look at this, um, the multi-channel output sample. And now in here, what they're doing is using a, uh, a, a channel router node. So this channel, ra channel router node lets you, for instance, suppose you had um, five channels of incoming audio and you wanted to select two of those channels and output them uh, to the speakers as a you know, left and right stereo pair. So using the channel router, you can take uh, different channels from the input and map them to different channels in the output. Um, the way this, uh, you do this by calling this route function on the, on the node. And the first overload basically says how to divide all of the input channels into two chunks and we will remap the first chunk according to the set of supplied indices and then the remaining chunk will be mapped to other indices and if you want to map channels one by one you can use the second overload uh, or if you want to manage the channels in more than just two groups this one has the input channel index the output channel index and the number of channels that were that are to be mapped so or routed <coughs> in this case they're they're just uh, splitting them uh, into two groups and um, 
they're, they're not doing anything particularly fancy. They're just kind of demonstrating how you would handle a multi-channel situation. Um, let's take a look at input analyzer. So input analyzer is an example of using the microphone. Uh, Adam says he's got to run. Thanks for the information. You're welcome. Um, in this case, as I mentioned, when you have nodes that are connected to specific hardware for your platform, there's a specific factory method for creating those nodes on the context. So in this case, it's a create input device node. And when we, let's run this, and when we run this sample, it's monitoring my microphone and showing a frequency plot of whatever is coming across from my input device, which in this case is my microphone. So obtaining audio input is also easy. It's just another node and you can change the parameters, the sample rate and so on by adjusting the context, uh, parameters specific to the input format, uh, I don't know if the does the input node. Let's find out if it has any specific methods for manipulating. Looks like it has some methods where we can query uh, underruns and overruns. Uh, can change some information about the ring buffer that is used to store the data, but not much else. So any further processing you would want to do on that audio input, say like you want to mute it unless the volume is above a certain level in order to um, cancel out inputs that have noisy background, that would be additional processing you would do in uh, additional nodes that you would connect up after the input device. Um, the other samples that remain that are, uh, are you know, this delay feedback, is just showing you how to use a delay node, I believe. Or they're showing you how to, uh, yeah, this delay is a delay node. So there's, you know, you can delay samples in the audio stream. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Their documentation is good. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to generally start in either at the guide and walk through this guide which pretty much covers the the same information that I just went through only in more detail and then in the reference category you'll want to be familiar with these IO functions for attaching audio files as sources they can also save an audio stream but the uh, at least on Windows the only output format that they support is WAV file format so if you needed to save files in mp3 or in some other encoding format then you would need a custom uh, node yourself that overrides um, the methods on output device node to create a um, actually I think it would be output node would be the node that you would use as your base class base class for nodes that consume an audio signal for an example speakers and then the output device node has additional information that's specific to devices. If you were just syncing to a file, I think you would probably just use output node as your base class. But there, as you can see here, as we're kind of drilling through this and exploring things, everything's uh, got at least some kind of documentation on it. So if we click on any of these highlighted boxes for the methods, it gives, you know, just a simple one line description. Uh, for what that method does. Um, enables this node for processing at when seconds on the timeline measured to context get num processor seconds and so on. So I think Cinder succeeds at its goal which is to make simple things simple and give you the ability to do more complicated things but since Cinder is more um, graphics focused than it is audio focused they give you some audio abilities but it's not 
you know, super high-end audio advanced processing like we saw with Marcius, which was more designed around audio processing, um, including we didn't drill into the details of it, but it, Marcius has support for processing by neural networks. So if your goal is to create an application with either simple audio playback needs and you have a need for 3D graphics as well, I would give Cinder a strong recommend. If you just need to do audio processing perhaps offline, Marcius would be a good library to consider. If you want to process uh, chiptune music as we mentioned or as we discussed two months ago when we looked at bass, um, bass is really one of the few solutions out there. There are some other libraries for chiptune music, but bass is um, if not the most popular then it's like number two so that rounds up our look at audio programming in C++ if there's any questions we can take those before we wrap it up I was gonna say this is a very good presentation so I don't have any questions okay great all right well then we will stop it there